I'm David Ware with the Arkansas State Archives, and I'm here today with Theo Witzel, an ethnobotanist from one of our sibling agencies, the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. And we're here to talk about the Virginia Prior Herbarium. In a previous video, I talked a little bit about how this came into our possession, how it's, it's the it's basically some of the legacy passed on by a young woman who in 1855 put together a collection of natural plants. A few months ago, I showed this to Theo and he got downright excited about it. So Theo, what makes this so special? Well, David, the, the neatest thing about this is these are the oldest plant specimens, preserved plant specimens from Arkansas that are actually in the state. Mm -hmm. So the earliest uh, collections from Arkansas that we know to still survive were collected by Thomas Nuttall in 1819. Yeah. And unfortunately, those are all housed out of state. So what, 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 can, what can we learn about the, the, the ecology of Jefferson County from looking at this? Well, quite a bit. And it's, it's kind of neat because if, if we know kind of where they were collected and we have mm -hmm. a good idea that they were right. from the general close vicinity of, of White Sulphur Springs and we know uh, when they were collected, that gives us sort of a snapshot of some of the local plant, um, right. the plant diversity that was there. And then also some of these plants that are in the herbarium here occur in a really specific habitat type. Mm -hmm. There's a number of uh, ferns in here and some orchids that are found in what we call uh, wooded seep communities. They're, they're natural wetlands where the groundwater seeps up from the underground and, and saturates the mm -hmm. soil for the whole year. Kind of like around a spring. <laughs> around a spring is exactly right. White Sulphur Springs but took its name from a sulphur spring. People would go there to drink the water to be, or bathe in it. They thought that um, drinking stinky water or bathing in it was good for your health. At any rate, there was a small resort hotel there, some farms, some shops, and a couple of churches. Very likely that, although today the springs have been like capped off, I saw photos you yes. had of the spring was concreted in, had a pipe. Uh, back in the early days, certainly in the mid-1800s, there were probably a lot more natural, and there were these seepage wetlands around the springs. And there's several plants in here uh, that definitely came from that habitat, there's no question. Another neat thing about this collection is it's a mix of the wild plants that were in natural habitats and some cultivated plants. So to the botanical historian, it gives a snapshot of what were people growing for ornamental purposes at that time. Right. People had been living around, around the Sulphur Springs area for perhaps a decade by this time. It was, mm -hmm. already, a, it was already almost a suburb of, of Pine Bluff, seven miles distant, and so you'd find introduced plants there. Absolutely, yeah. And it's really neat here. This uh, particular uh, collection is actually a mixed collection. It's identified here as wild plum. And the, the plants, uh, there's actually two species here. So the ones on the right here are, in fact, one of the wild plums. Mm -hmm. And the one on the left here is a service berry, which blooms at the same time. Both mm -hmm. of them bloom before the leaves come out in probably March, late March. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just shows, you know, the two. Those would be some of the earliest blooming species there. Um going to kind of close and open this way. And here again is the service berry with the leaves. And so the, okay. the leaves happen way later in the year or a month later probably come out. So she knew enough to go back and get the leaves to go with the flowers. So that's mm -hmm. a kind of a neat thing there. And then this is a non-native ornamental rose, uh, the multiflora rose, which no doubt was collected mm -hmm. uh, or no doubt was planted around there. And today it's actually a Pretty serious invasive species. I was talking about those seep plants. Now this is a classic uh, seep obligate. It only occurs in groundwater wetlands in this part of the world. And this is a royal fern. And it almost always grows with another very showy fern called a cinnamon fern, which is this one here. Okay. And she did a great job of getting both types of frond. So it has a sterile frond that is you know used for photosynthesis and then it has this modified fertile frond which is the spore producing uh organ organs of the of the yes. plant so really great um and it's come loose a little bit but it's all here and uh and uh got all the parts you need but the the neatest thing in this herbarium in my opinion is this plant right here this is a Kentucky lady slipper orchid. Okay. And Kentucky lady slipper is a species of conservation concern. It's rare. It's found um, 
in a small sort of region of the southeast U.S., centered on Arkansas, mm -hmm. but it has a, a narrow range globally. So it's of global conservation concern. It's also under threat from deer overpopulation. They eat these mm -hmm. up um, under threat from illegal digging. They're quite valuable as a black market horticultural uh, mm -hmm. target. And, uh, and there's only one other collection from Jefferson County. It's very, really, really rare in the coastal plain. It would have been around the margins of seeps or in deep ravines. Yeah. And um, this particular plant was only collected one other time in 1976 from Jefferson County. Uh, so this is really a gem right here to have that Kentucky mm -hmm. Lady Slipper. So, so what's next for, for the herbarium? Well, um, it's in remarkable condition for having presumably not been stored in archival uh, right. conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So here it is, uh, 170 years old uh, <laughs> and not bug-eaten mm -hmm. to any great degree, which is right. remarkable. Uh, but we will put this in uh, a quarantine period of about two weeks. So we'll okay. freeze this at about 30 below zero and low humidity. Uh, just to kill any insects that might be here and haven't seen any, but they're small sometimes. Uh, it will then be stored at in our Natural Heritage Commission's herbarium, which is a specially uh, designed facility that has low humidity and low temperature. And at that, if you can keep the bugs and the moisture out under those conditions, these will last indefinitely. So, uh -huh. and you know, we don't want to handle this too much. So what right. we'll do is we'll take high resolution images, uh, photographs of each page. And uh, we'll make those available to the public uh, on a, you know, in some way, on either through you. We or, have we have yeah, we have a web you have platform a way. for this. <laughs> Absolutely, the Arkansas Digital Archives collection. There we go. <laughs> so we'll make sure that that gets represented as mm -hmm. well. Good deal. Because yeah, uh, this is a neat. This is a really neat thing. You guys were uh, fortunate to to get this donated. Yeah. Well, this was the first. This was the first accession after I took on my my new job here in January, and I counted. Um, I counted a good omen. <laughs> For sure. Leo, thank you for coming over today. My pleasure. Thank you. And for this week, this is David Weir at the Arkansas State Archives reminding you, here at the Archives, we have all sorts of stuff from Arkansas, 200 years worth of it and more, and it's all waiting for you here to explore. Thank you. <laughs>